Brother Jahan. Brother Terry. Take two. <laughs> this is take two. Um, I foolishly wasn't recording video. Um, and also we got re- um, interrupted pretty yes. hardcore the first time. We did. We did. Um, but we're here. Mm-hmm. Um, At work. Night shift. Yeah. Night four of four. Night two of two. Yeah. So maybe you're in more of sync than I am. So there's two, two ways of thinking about it. One is you're more acclimatized to this night shift stees than I am. Mm. Um, the other way of thinking about it is you are like struggle town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, double-edged sword. Mm. Yeah, I was watching some podcasts on Rhonda Patrick's website, uh, yeah. Found My Fitness. Great and podcast. Yeah, fantastic podcast. Mm. Really good source of information. A good bridge. What we're trying to do as well, like a bridge between yeah. hardcore science and chatting to a broad number of different people. She's definitely yeah. on the hardcore science end of things. Mm. Yeah. yeah. She was interviewing a PhD sleep candidate who um, was discussing how you can only change your circadian rhythm by three hours, okay. even if you do everything perfectly. Mm. So I'm on night four or four, haven't been doing things perfectly to try and change my circadian rhythm, Yeah. but I think, what would that mean, sort of maybe six or seven hours shifted? Mm. So it probably will be easier. I'm feeling pretty good right now. It's what look, it's looking pretty good. It's oh, wow. <laughs> okay. How, just quarter past two in the morning. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Sleep. Sleep is. Uh, I I love the topic of sleep. It's been such a goldmine to me. I think it's one of those things like aging, who, which isn't necessarily obvious. Mm. You know, it's not a traditional thing that people discuss or talk about. No. In fact, the opposite. People sort of shirked. Mm. Just like a, this yep. is an inevitable part of life. Here we go. Be right back, folks. Sorry. <clears throat> what a um, epic uh, break. Mm. Um, many things happened. Busy. Yeah. Mm. Um, so now ten to four. And hopefully we uh, we'll have a, a clear window. Mm. Often at this time things do quieten them down a little bit before they ramp back up for the. Morning yeah, mm. I did write down a couple of things that I did want to, a couple of ideas that I wanted to mm. discuss if let's we get it. to it. Um, I really want to talk about nasal breathing. Let's just talk about nasal breathing. Yeah. One thing I wanted to talk, say <laughs> was that um, <laughs> one interesting thing about the Spartans was one of their like training things would be like to take a, a mouthful of water and hold the water in their mouth and go for runs. Yeah, yes, I, I remember um, that, yep clearly enforcing the breathing through the nose. Mm. So when I do run, I don't like running very much, but when I do run, I, I try and do like nasal breathing. Mm, yeah, I even when I do any sort of cardio-based stuff, mm. it's hard when I, I do a lot of fighting, you, you do a lot of yelling and stuff. But mm. if it's a, if I'm just by myself hitting a pad or working up a sweat somehow, I try to do it through the nose as well. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know why. I knew it was just harder, so I was doing it. But yeah. very recently, I've spent a lot of time learning why it's so good it's pretty funny it's a, a lot of the martial arts have like real specific breathing mm, um, yeah. techniques and patterns one of the um, annoying aspects of kendo was the um, innate um, thing about shouting yeah a really loud kiai right and a really oh. long it's a really so, distinctive kiai in kendo uh, so i um used to do fencing a lot and on friday nights they would train our training session was at the same time as like a kendo training session oh. in the same venue and it was so annoying. <laughs> that would be quite distracting. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, I do Kyokushin karate and like most karate styles, you, when you're doing a basic set of techniques, you kiai or yell with every technique. Yeah. Which really leads to a, a distinctive pattern of breathing whilst you're exercising. Mm. Because you're doing so much, but doing it in a really rhythmic fashion. Mm. Yeah, breath is like anything you can really do, think deeply about it. Mm. Um, mm. And yeah, there's a lot to the breath. Definitely. And the link to the autonomic nervous system that we were talking mm. about last night as well. I'm going into that for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. I think the way to highlight why nasal breathing is so good mm. is to approach it from the perspective about why it's so bad when you can't nasal breathe. Why is that? 
I would like just with all the most of the scientific literature focuses on people with nasal congestion mm. or nasal polyps or yeah. nasal obstruction, turbinate hypertrophy within the nose, mm. and the difficulties they then face yeah. Yeah, from symptoms prognostically and yeah, comorbidities that are even linked to it. Just long term outcomes being shit. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So ipso facto, by that great yeah. phrase, I love that. <laughs> by that very fact. No, nasal breathing is so good for you because it stops the re- all those um, negative consequences. Yeah. I started in like the 1600s. There's really good documented uh, material by physicians of the time yeah. talking about why it's, they are just noticing these problems in people who were, were mm. loud snoring. Mm. Um, a little bit more refined these days. But yeah. Interesting you talk about the 1600s. There are a lot of really interesting manuals on, on these sort of topics. One, I read a, um, so there's a lot of um, interest in sleep, as, as we mentioned um, earlier and often. Um, but one of the things, one of the research areas is like, what is the actual native human sleeping pattern? Mm. And the idea being that like the eight hour block that we tend to do is not actually what we're supposed to be doing necessarily. So people often talk about biphasic, biphasic sleep patterns or like polyphasic sleep patterns. Uh, and in the Middle Ages, um, there was like a there was like a whole school of thought about what you do in in the middle. I can't remember what this time of day was, but like this middle section where people would wake up for a couple of hours um, in the middle of the night and like do things, have a meal and share yeah, time. yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've recall yeah. vaguely what you're talking about. I think I've seen similar stuff. And it's a whole. It was a whole thing. Um, mm. I guess the Spanish sort of have the most, like, a, the thing that's most akin to that sort of pattern. The siesta. siesta. Yeah. 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 I know, on the on the surface, that doesn't seem to track well with me. Mm. I really like circadian rhythms. Mm. Seem to really promote a single, unbroken block. block of sleep to be the most beneficial. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know. Made, uh, polyphasic sleep made famous by, uh, I think, Kramer in Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Seinfeld references, I think, all day. Mm. Mm. I can go for several dates. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, promoting nasal breathing, either by I mean, surgical intervention or... Um, Operating on the nose, deviated septums, cutting down turbinates, removing adenoids, all seems to track pretty well with better clinical outcomes. Mm. These people sleep better, um, have less sort of allergic rhinitis even. Cool. Um, so then going one step further and keeping in track with what our podcast normally focuses on, how to optimize good health mm. rather than um, treat health once it's already quite bad. Mm. So tips to promote general good sleep via nasal breathing. Shout out to Michael Dent, one of my mates who's got me onto this. Mm. I put a slight little bit of tape over my mouth recently. Mm. Very recently. I've only done it for the last like four or five nights. Um, And it's not in a way to occlude your mouth. You don't want to be stepping it on as if you've been kidnapped or something like that. Um, Which, sidebar, uh, is something that I've certainly done. (laughs) (laughs) So you went full wrap across I went the, the full, mouth. I went the full Monty, my friend. Was like <laughs> tape all over the mouth. And to be honest, it wasn't that bad. But um, yeah, <laughs> there was a bit of pulling of saliva behind it that uh, reduces the effectiveness of the tape. So. Wow. No, I didn't. I wasn't keen to fully wrap the mouth. I just Because mm-hmm. you're just trying to alert your mind consciously whilst you're falling asleep and then unconsciously whilst asleep to keep your mouth closed. Mm-hmm. But if I needed to, I could easily sort of break the tension of the tape and open my mouth. Yeah, yeah. But it's just sort of gently sitting there. But there really is. Promoting like, You really don't need to. Well, I reckon I do because I used to wake up really dry mouth, needing water, a bit nasally congested. Yeah, maybe. Which are like all the signs that I had been sleeping mm. um, by breathing, oh, sorry, breathing through my mouth while sleeping. And plus my wife would say, yeah, you snore a little bit. Yeah. Only a little bit, not, not too much. Wonder Nothing sh- a good little kick would fix. Yeah. One of the interesting things about the the nasal whole side of things is 
in nasal patency is that like if you test it there's always one side mm. that's more blocked than the other and um uh, it switches the blood flow the yeah switches there's, right? a, there's a whole nasal cycle yeah yep. so there's a control thing where one nostril is designed to be slightly more occluded because a narrower lumen the, or the size of the part that path is narrower so the air traveling through it is actually quicker mm. and then the other one is obviously bigger and they're traveling through it is slower and so this optimizes certain olfactory receptors for certain um, tasks or like, you know, for, I don't know, binding yeah. certain things. So it, it even <laughs> promotes nitric oxide. Um, no kidding. Nitric dioxide. Nitric. Man, it's so early in the morning. Yeah, NO2. <laughs> it promotes NO2 production that they will then find its way down into your alveoli, promote mm. vasodilation. That's no, another... I didn't know that. Big, yeah, I just learned about that with um, one of the many benefits of nasal breathing. Nasal breathing. Because mm. or even generally speaking, normal respiration is always better through the nose, right? Yeah. So you've got this large surface area governed by the turbinates, sort of, mm. how would you describe them? The, just the architecture of the nose yeah. provides a massive filtration system and humidification system. Mm. Humidification is barely at all achieved through mouth breathing. Yeah. So you're warming the air to the right, the your body temperature mm. so that the gas exchange that will happen in your lungs will be more efficient. Mm. And you're yeah you're getting rid of all this turbulent flow and making it nice and laminar as it's coming down through into your respiratory system. Mm. Well, that sounds great, right? Sounds pretty good to me. And yeah. then it tracked well with me heuristically that yeah. that would be better um, method while sleeping. And the idea of being slack jawed is bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Yep. Yeah, yeah there, there's this um, uh, reflex system where that when the mouth is open as it would generally sort of sink backwards. Um, there's a reflex system that operates where you won't be able to enter further into um, mm. the deeper cycles of sleep, mm. which is was crazy to me. That is crazy. I hadn't realized that. Yeah. And it sort of shuts off some of the nasal receptors, shuts off that NO2 pathway I've just mm. alluded to. Mm. Very weird. And we know just in I mean, our line of work, when you're trying to keep an airway patent, you, you're pulling the jaw forward yeah. and out. And being that you're sleeping and nice and relaxed, that it's going to sort of fall backward. It all shrinks it together. The, yeah, mm. and occlude the airway. None mm. of that sounds good. Compare nasal to mouth. No. It seems very logical that nasal breathing is so much better. It's just that yeah, I haven't thought too, about it much. Like, is if you're asleep and you're in the bush... You know, if you go camping and you like doing some open air camping, I mean, if you sleep with your mouth open, you're gonna like eat bugs and a lot of bugs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's probably like a threat to the airway at some <clears> point. <throat> if something big falls in, you go, and like all of a sudden you've got you're choking on a bug. <laughs> Whilst true, that yeah, is a rare example. Yes, yep, I would agree. But I'm gonna say it's a super rare example. I mean, I think most people will have consumed a large number of insects throughout their lifetime <clears throat> just mm. during their sleep. There's that weird rumour about spiders, right? You eat eight spiders a year or something crazy yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it was spiders. but <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a whole bunch of wildlife that probably gets caught in your mouth while you're sleeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So I think I'm very much on the bandwagon of nasal breathing while sleeping is far superior. And if yeah. you've got, if you haven't got any significant nasal problems i think the tape idea is a good way to go yeah other than that i'd be speaking to your gp about getting looked at for any deviated septum or mm. adenoid removal ent referrals mm. yeah this is something we spend a huge amount of our life doing right sleep yeah ideally. At, least, at least a third <clears throat> you want to make sure it's good good quality yeah which is not happening right now no Mm. Yeah, you and I are quite sleep deprived right now. Mm. A necessary evil of the job, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, well. I I don't know about the effect size though, of it of nasal breathing. Do you know what I mean? Like. The, like overall outcome. Yeah. Abusive. Yeah. I think we'd be surprised. That's just my guess though. Possibly. Yeah. Because it's like, the, I mean, the reason why we're talking about it now is because it's such an upstream factor of health, right? Mm. Such as aging. I mean, you can treat all these diseases that come with age individually. 
Yeah. Or you can target the underlying process of aging and hopefully... Don't get me wrong, man. I'm, I'm on effect. 10 days of reading. Yeah. But to <laughs> yeah. play, yeah. To play the, the, the sober devil's advocate, mm. I mean, at the end of the day, you're oxygenating. You know, it's all doing the same. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. How big of an effect Qu is it? Quality really? of oxygenation. Yeah. And then there's these. It's a dial. It's a dial you tweak, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good way to put, look at it's it. It's a dial you tweak. Hmm. Hmm. So I think nasal breathing is definitely a way to go. And then the timing and duration of sleep. The whole point of all these this discussion is to get to the fact that we think this is involved in aging as well, right? Yeah. And I think optimizing your sleep well, I definitely as think this upstream factor will, will have an effect. I definitely think circadian rhythm is mm. involved in aging. Yeah. Which is the timing part of sleep. Duration yeah. is the most common thing people talk about. How many hours did you sleep? Yeah. And looks like it's pretty universally should be around eight. Mm. Anything less than seven has been well, well demonstrated to be detrimental. Yeah. Um, but then the timing of when you get those eight hours is quite important. Mm. But sticking with duration alone, or actually no, sticking with timing as well. Like you and I, we're sleeping during the day right now, mm. um, which is really not optimal. Mm. And we're sleep deprived anyway, we're not sleeping as long. No, you just can't. And there's good, yeah. uh, these really nice studies that even after three or four nights in a row of night shift behavior, mm your metabolic system goes so out of whack that you can be pre-diabetic. Mm. Like such an acute change. Um, which is a little concerning, especially if you're a career night shift worker. Yeah. That's really not boding well. Um, it's no good. We should test our mm. blood glucose levels. Well, I mean, I just... I had, I had a moment of weakness and ate <laughs> a whole bunch toasties. of like... <laughs> a whole bunch of like crackers and bread and a cheese toast, yeah. two cheese toasties. So I, um, I'm not in a state to test any, yeah. <laughs> yeah. any blood sugars. I've been fasting since just after eight. So was I. <laughs> <laughs> was. In nearly at eight hours. Reset the time. Mm. <laughs> mm. So yeah, duration is obviously really important. Um, mm. But the timing of that sleep, being trying to link it with your natural circadian rhythm, mm and obviously overnight um, seems to make a huge effect of the quality of sleep that you're having. Yeah. Mm. I wonder if um, this recent societal adaption we're having in COVID, whether people are going to have more flexibility on that sort of thing. Mm, yeah, and to experiment term. with like sleeping patterns, you know, polyphasic, biphasic sleeping, you know, napping during the day. Mm. It certainly will cut out huge amounts of commute time, right? You the, think, yeah. The new society going forward, having a large shift towards working from home and mm. remote work, mm. meaning that your work is just where your laptop is. Yeah. Um, obviously, not all professions can do that. Um, but even a large part of our profession, a lot of primary care consults are over telehealth. Telehealth, yeah. yeah. Which would be, yeah, it would be a good thing. Cutting out commutes longer time you can have in bed. Mm. Um, what, what's really interesting actually, and quite topical, is when I started this run of night shifts, um, I wasn't working the day after daylight saving. Mm. So here in Victoria, Australia, recently we uh, lost an hour mm. of sleep. And there's been re these really cool studies that have pointed out this worldwide phenomenon, often talked about in the literature is that one of the largest experiments conducted because such a huge amount of the population mm. loses an hour of sleep at once yeah. and what are some mm. of the effects that come with that and I'm going to screw up the numbers here because I'm a bit tired but I think it's high 20s low 30s percent yeah. increase in um, heart attacks mm. or at least acute coronary syndrome when you lose that hour of sleep and you saw this well I wasn't working but the the person I'm sharing these night shifts with um, when I got the hand over, she said she had nine cardiac admissions on her shift alone. And the team in the 24 hour period had 22 admissions. Mm. Um, and that's the day after daylight savings. So the effect of losing that hour of sleep is coming into fruition. And there was a definitely a huge yeah, peak above the noise. 
experiences I had too, three cardiac admissions a night. And the, this that night shift had nine and the team had 22 in a day. Mm. So and it's someone with brittle physiology yeah. already. Yeah. It'll just... And that population yeah. effect of losing that hour means that the numbers will jump. Mm. And what's really interesting is on the tail end, six months later when we gain an hour, mm. you see a drop. A mm. 20 to 30 percent drop in challenge the challenge yeah yeah a b testing <laughs> it's so fascinating because you think that you know people would be losing an hour here or there all the time mm. but you've got to average that out across the population and that's when you see that's that peak you have the, the brutal people in that category definitely mm. so duration obviously matters and then the timing is a huge part of that as well yeah, yeah. based mainly on circadian rhythm which we should talk about a little bit so the it looks like the main obvious driver that's often talked about is melatonin, right? Yeah, that plays a plays a role. <laughs> yeah, it plays a role. Yeah. It is a bit of a mystery what it's actually doing, right? Yeah. Like the, the melatonin itself or just the oh. circadian sort of clocks? I, I mean mean to say when we give melatonin because it doesn't right, really yeah. have the effect. Yeah. So, I mean, we do know that melatonin peaks when we're going to sleep. It seems to trigger it. Um, but the question, I guess what we're talking about here is whether um, whether giving it as an oral supplementation, which a lot of people do, mm, yep. has an effect. And there's not really a good amount of evidence for it. So. No, there's not. It seems to be um, reasonably reproducible of having a beneficial effect in mm. jet lag. Mm where you've acutely switched your circadian rhythm. Yeah. Um, but other than that, not much. Because so, melatonin is largely based on the light entering the eyes, right? So we've got special receptors at the back of our eye that instead of just producing an image in the visual part of the brain, head off towards the suprachiasmatic nucleus and tell that, that yeah. oh, I'm seeing a lot of light and I should be awake. And as the night enters and light fades, yeah. that corresponds to a melatonin rise. Mm. So you, it makes good logic. You give melatonin, you want to try and copy that rise, yeah. but it's just not being... There's more stuff going on, Jeremy, in the literature. There's more stuff going on than that. Mm. Um, I do. Mm. We'll pause right there. All right. Where were we? Uh, it's getting rid of melatonin. Yeah. More going on. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. I feel like this is a very nascent area in terms of the broader effects of sleep yeah there's been a lot of great studies going on like people mm. working in sleep would hate me saying that like there, there is it's quite a fruitful area but our broader understanding about many of the effects that mm. are linked to circadian rhythms um, is pretty low yeah. or in its infancy yeah so two has been linked to circadian rhythm that's usually important mm. um especially like i think so two and one and mm. um, so two and three um in counteracting the effects of um, clock, which is like a regulatory um, pathway promoter, gene promoter, um, aptly named um, because it's yeah. part of that gene um, circadian gene activation, mm, which yeah. is super interesting. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense, right? That the body knows, okay, this particular part of the day I'm going to go into the DNA and activate this gene mm. to have this effect mm. okay now it's mid-afternoon I don't particularly need that effect I'm going to shut that gene down yeah turn this one on yeah which I think challenges maybe some people's perception of the traditional way that genes work because gene transcription you activate that gene yeah you read that and create proteins that will then have effect mm. and that is traditionally like a longer process right yeah um but it can be quite rapid. Yeah, it can be very rapid. Mm. Very interesting area. It harkens back to this whole thing of you have like a cellular process and then you have the cells interacting, you have like tissues and then you have like different types of tissues communicating and you have the organism and you have this mm. hierarchical level of um, organisation. I think we should call occurs. that the Jahan theory. It's not. It's not a Jahan theory. It's, like, <laughs> it's just something I love to think about. Yes. Um, these uh, hierarchical like network effects, and um, I think the circadian 
process is just super interesting because you have to not only coordinate a cell to have one cell to have to be regulating genes in a circadian way, but you need to mm. coordinate amongst a whole bunch of cells to be regulating genes in a circadian way, which means they have to be communicating. Um, mm. And then the tissues themselves have to be communicating with each other. And so the complexity becomes vast very quickly. Definitely non-linear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Which is why it's so difficult to get answers, right? Because all that interaction creates noise, and especially mm. if you're trying to find only one particular outcome or study one aspect of sleep, mm. and uh, understandably blind to everything else that's going on. Yeah. One question I had was, um, if this day-night cycle, so there are a few clues. So let me just let me just backtrack a second. So and and establish some things that we do know. So we do know that there are two really powerful cues that regulate our circadian cycle. One is light that mm -hmm. we've mentioned. The other one is food. Um, and so we have a food trigger um, and a nutrient intake um, stimulates a certain circadian pattern. And it, as a side note, it seems that if we eat during daylight hours, um, that's more beneficial than if we eat at night time because mm. that seems to be when we're primed to accept nutrient intake. Um, maybe that's obviously going to be different if you're a nocturnal mammal, but yeah. for human beings, yeah. that seems to be the case. Mm. Um, so, so those are two things we know. Um, and then, then the question be, for me becomes, um, I've mentioned before um, about um, whether... Um, what, what this is a question of like what is the overarching mechanism of controlling longevity that there's some underlying physiological clock um, that determines how we age and how we develop so um, what is the thing that's regulating that and one question I had was like well could these signals could these light signals could these food signals be regulating how we age mm. and I think there's a there's more there's a lot of similarity between you know um, developmental uh, development as we um, as as a young person so like you know the stages of puberty and all those kind of things that's regulated aging in an organised way um, but I think there are similarities between that and the regulated sort of decline that we have as we age um, that just seems to be the same across everybody <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, and so I haven't found any good, strong research in it, but there are certain things like intracephalic organism studies where they like extend the length of the day, light day cycle. So instead of it being like a 24 hour cycle, it'll be like a 36 hour cycle, like an 18 hour cycle. So you can modulate that and then look and see what happens to the organism that's living in this environment where the length of a day is different. Yep. Um, and intracephala, um, a shorter, um, time period sped up certain developmental milestones, which I thought was sort of interesting. So it seemed to speed up certain, clock, certain yeah. elements of aging. Hmm. But then what was weird is, so then you would think, well, if I increase this light day cycle, maybe, um, maybe slow it would slow things down, down but yeah. didn't, it actually didn't. So the, it, it turned out that the further it drifted away from the 24 hour peak, um, the shorter it, this sort of, I think it was like time to egg development, like when they were like, when they had lay eggs and that sort yeah. of stuff. No, um, we're talking about fruit flies there. Yeah, correct. Yeah. We're talking about fruit flies. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. So it's like an optimal 24 hours in any shift either side of that curve. Yeah. See, I'm is, not going to say it necessarily is deleterious, but it probably is. Mm, yeah. Um, I, think, I think your theory is really well founded. Like mm. it makes a, a lot of sense. And I think I, I would even add in that um, sleep pressure, mm. another aspect that regulates just our normal sleeping cycle, the build-up of certain chemicals in the brain that mm. really try to push sleep on you. I think you can kind of liken that to being analogous to blood sugar levels, mm. where chronically high levels of blood sugar levels are obviously very bad for you. Yeah. And it leads to diabetes, you know, all these terrible diseases, that, again, linked with aging. Mm. And so you're metabolic health is the key word these days and yeah having a really good um maintainable levels of blood sugar levels it has really good effects in long term 
Mm. So I think maintaining your sleep pressure mm. at uh, um, favorable levels over a long period would have really good effects. Mm. I, mean, I don't know if that study's been done or not. Yeah. But yeah, having chronically high sleep pressure, staying out really late, caffeinating, you know, mm. battling against that sleep pressure that's naturally occurring, which mm. is completely independent of the circadian rhythm, interestingly. Mm. Um, so two different pathways entirely. Um, but definitely really strong correlation, arguably causation with Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general, mm. and chronically high patterns of sleep pressure. Mm. Um, so I think keeping them down to a manageable level by a good, healthy, regular sleep yeah. is my theory that it would have that effect on this physiological clock that we're um, postulating is there mm. and be sort of an input that, yet yeah, things are good, maintain this clock. For sure. Over a 24 hour period. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I like your theory. I think you're right. Yeah. It just needs, I wish we, I wish I had like uh, access to a lab. Yeah. 10 just lifetimes like, to do everything we wanted. Yeah. To. There was, there's actually a really cool company um, where um, I think it's going to be like the future of biological research in many ways where you can sort of, um, they have like a, a huge panel of like standardized things you can do, um, like reagents, um, molecular analysis, you know, like anything you want to do on like a, I don't know, on some kind of biological assay or something like, like that. Like a an organism or ordering? I think, I think uh, I'd have to double check, but I think it's like stuff you send into them and they can do, do the experiments for you. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. And, but, but it, it goes a step further where you can actually like program experiments to run and so it oh. sort of becomes like a like a platform where you can sort of learn like a, a program i can't remember what this thing's called we'll be right back we uh we lost video there for a while i think we uh, uh but we're back yeah i'm back um i think i was mentioning uh this lab company yeah, um, yeah. that's really cool essentially they offer they operate remotely and um, it's sort of more of a platform and you can almost like code experiments you want to do and then they sort of run them, run these assays and run whatever you want to... That's called. a game changer. That's it's a big, it's a big deal. Like it's hard to implement, um, mm. but it's a cool idea. Mm. Um, I agree. I think in the long term it's a game changer and probably how a lot of um, this real analytical biology will be done. Yeah, yep. Um, I think it opens up... Um, uh, something that I think is like really important in biology, which is like theoretical biology. Like everyone's familiar with like theoretical physics, um, but I think uh, more and more, considering how complex this whole thing is, you just need like big picture guys to mm, like yep. yeah. start like bringing like a lot of different parts together. Uh, and in many ways, like that's what um, like heads of labs do. Um, it's what a lot of, you know, every biologist does that to a, some degree, but, um, it's very easy to get really caught down into the detail of like what you do into your own little specialty. Um, mm. That happens a lot in medicine. Yeah. And, and the effect it has on your career, right? Like mm. sometimes it can just be about the work rather than the cause. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, trying to promote health. Medicine's a great example, I think, of that. They're yeah. quite... A limited number of doctors who are trying to change the game. Mm. It's more, and that's probably because it's one, a really hard game. Yeah. Two, a really stressful game. Yeah. Three, we'll be right back. <laughs> so the lab. Lab. Yeah, it's just cool. Game it's just cool. Mm. It's cool biology stuff. Um, yeah, that's really all I had to say. Mm. Theoretical biology and um, computational biology. I like the paradox. Speaking of testing stuff, mm. that sleep specialists work in labs, watching other people sleep, yeah, and therefore don't sleep well themselves. Yeah, it's pretty funny. That's an interesting aside. Yeah, maybe they need to automate that, just like yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. save themselves. Mm. It okay. is, it is like a pandemic of not being, um, not getting enough sleep. I think. 
Mm. Mm. And the effects would would be huge. We'll, we'll look back once we've cracked more of this. Yeah. Um, Science even there and be like, wow, we really didn't pay as much attention. But I mean, what's the alternative? Just living in a cave. Just with nature at one. What do you mean? No, no, I mean like, <laughs> up to, like getting your sleep so much better. No, but I think what I, what I mean is um, like, if we didn't do what we're doing now, like, uh, where, would, right. where would we be as like a Society. civilization? Yeah. Just like a... But there could be better practices in place for people like, you know, we have to do night shift, right? There has to be doctors here in this hospital. But... I mean, does there? Yeah, I think so. I mean... Uh, has some of the work you've done tonight, <laughs> I mean, some of it isn't as urgent, but there's been... I reckon if we weren't here, probably fewer people would get... Feel com- like comfortable hurting themselves so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. overnight. Yeah. True. People might think twice before um, embarking on a <laughs> risky behaviour. On a risky behaviour, yeah. Just one aspect. <laughs> um, it's too much of a safety net, mate. We're molly yeah. coddling society. <laughs> <laughs> one perspective. <laughs> yeah. I do not condone um, yeah. my own opinions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, I think there is a physiological clock. I think it is linked to aging, mm. and I think there are simple things we can do to optimize that system. And I think yeah. there are yet to be elucidated systems that, like anything in science, will probably really be really surprising yeah. when we actually find them. One of the interesting things I think is that NAD pathways are really linked to. Um, this circadian rhythms, mm. sleep deprivation reduces that oscillatory clock um, in the cells. Um, NAD falls, and you get less activation gene activation because a lot of these circadian gene activations are dependent on NAD, um, just by virtue of sirtuin activation or mm. um, other types of things. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So the, the link. Is clear, right? The the um, pathways, or the, sorry, the the logic leading us down to sleep being a key factor in aging is is rich, right? It's not just also, a shot in the dark. Also, like sleep disturbance being like a key symptom of aging. Mm, yeah. Yep. Um, Causal, uh, like chicken or egg kind of approach as well. It's really. Yeah. Alzheimer's is the best area to talk about this, right? Or dementias in general. But it's also, the Alzheimer's is a confusing one because when people also talk about Alzheimer's as being like you know, type 3 diabetes mm, mm. Um, because of the, this tight link to um, insulin, really. And metabolic dysfunction, mm. which has already been pointed out, has acute and chronic effects based on lack of sleep. Mm. And Alzheimer's and lack of sleep uh, are like very arguably causal. Yeah. So the, like the whole syndrome is is yeah. fitting in, right? Metabolic dysfunction, lack of sleep, mm. memory issues, because sleep is so important for memory. Mm. Um, there's yeah. a, the really good studies showing like when mouses run through mazes and mm. the pathways that light up as they're learning the maze through waking hours. And then when they go to sleep, those pathways are repeated, uh, but repeated in super high speeds. Mm. Um, Best, best demonstrated to an audience audibly. So, like, as the mouse goes through, the neural pathways line up as a dit, 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 when they're learning the mouse. Yeah, yeah. And then when they're sleeping, what you would hear if you attached audio to their brain signals is like, so they're like relearning that pathway faster and faster and faster whilst they're sleeping. Yeah. So, a lack of sleep, lack of that memory learning, and shift from short term memory into long term memory, moving it to different parts of the brain. It's um, very Ooh. reminiscent of um, machine learning. Ooh. There's um, a branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning, which is a sort of um, um, the sort of artificial intelligence approach that you know, would make, was made famous with Go, with that um, AlphaGo, with the, yeah. AlphaGo, yeah, the deep mind um, algorithm that could beat Go was a reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so what does that mean exactly? So, so essentially. Um, to break it down, um, machine learning, there are a few different types of learning tasks. There's a supervised learning task where you have like a, a known... So say, for example, you're trying to label 
um, pictures of cats or dogs and they're labelled. And you have a, an algorithm guess whether it's a cat or a dog and then you tell it oh, actually it's a dog and then it back propagates that loss across the, um, the network and, that, and it right. updates like its parameters to make a better prediction next time. Oh, I see. Yeah. And so that's a supervised learning problem. An unsupervised learning problem could be something like clustering where you're like, you get a whole bunch of data and you sort of cluster things, but they're not labeled. Um, and it's just like learning features um, based on um, some un um, unlabeled innate characteristics of the data. So just giving it like a whole thousand pictures of dogs and yeah, saying, and what then, can you figure out? Yeah, and what can you figure out? And that's... Oh, uh, yeah. I, don't, I can't remember where I saw this, but one where they were trying to... I think it was an animal, but all the animals were on ice and the machine... Did you mm. tell me this? I don't know, I don't, I don't think the, so. Um, so the, but the machine learning algorithm picked up that just ice or snow or mm. whiteness being in the picture mm. meant it was this animal and that's yes, the part it focused yes, on. Yes, yes. So then you put a random animal on ice and it was yeah. like, oh yeah, this is a polar bear. If it was yeah, polar bear. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. so it could focus on the wrong thing. But yeah. That's unsupervised learning. Is it? No, that, that's actually, that is still supervised learning. But what you're doing okay. in that situation is you're trying to figure out what um, features the algorithm uses to um, right right so um, that's a whole other kettle of fish where you're trying to understand um, why the algorithm is making a decision it's making which is um, separate to the type of training algorithm you're using um, so you have supervised you have unsupervised and then you have sort of semi-supervised learning which is this case of reinforcement learning and our intuitive understanding of reinforcement learning is like trying to is like playing a game um, and you know you might like if you play monopoly you have an objective, you know, you want to get as much money as possible, for example, mm -hmm. um, or you want to get as many hotels as possible. Um, and um, one classic example is like, um, like Pac-Man, you know, you want to get as many points as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but the thing is, although it's sort of supervised in the sense that you can sort of feed back um, a reward to an algorithm to update its weights to optimize some um, reward function, um, but it's not obvious what 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 path it needs to take to get there, and so then that that this whole class of learning is called reinforcement learning, and it sort of fits in a semi-supervised setting because it doesn't have like a really clear outcome, um, but it's trying to um, learn with some feedback, but not like a really obvious one. Ooh. And that sounds like it'd be most applicable to the medical field when you're trying to learn a new. It sounds like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's not, like it. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Yeah, uh, right. it's complex. It's complex. Um, but um, what was the context that the we were bringing? Mice learning. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the reason why I bring brought up reinforcement learning in this context was um, uh, when you're talking about mice sleeping it sounds so in, in the context of reinforcement learning right so let's say you're a machine learning algorithm you're trying to learn how to play pac-man um, essentially the way often the way they set up these reinforcement algorithms to learn is they'll build up a, a big memory that they'll they'll train the algorithm on so essentially you'll, you'll let the algorithm loose in an environment and it'll practice and have a go at, at um, trying to solve pac-man you know move around and right. make a series of decisions um, and then you store some of those decisions as memories and you keep training the algorithm on these memories. And it just, it just really reminds me of that situation mm -hmm. where you have like, um, um, a reinforcement of an activity being forced into a memory. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. We'll be right back. And we're back. Mm. So tonight we thought we'd do a podcast on night shift. Given that we were talking about sleep, yeah. that would be appropriate. Yeah. And just a cool format, right? I think so. Like, yeah. um, doing what you can on the job. Yeah. 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 And we, I mean, this is what we do anyway, right? We, whenever we see each other, we talk about this stuff. So For sure. Thought we'd yeah. record it, see if we've got anything good. That's debatable. If we've got, if we've got anything good. Yeah, we're going to have to fix a lot in post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heavily interrupted, as we knew we would be. Yeah. Um, well, you know, like... It can be hit and miss. Some nights it is really quiet and mm. you could probably just just watch a few movies and go home and enjoy your sweet paycheck for nothing. But <laughs> this was the night that we, I think we earned it. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um, 
We didn't touch on too much of what I really wanted to get into, but... What did you really want to get into, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into the um, the links between sleep and Alzheimer's and mm. and how that correlates so well to the same sort of links of ageing. Like the multivariate effects that sleep impact yeah. upon as in the same way that ageing is like the, you know, the mm. number one risk factor for nearly every mm. disease, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that's why I see such a parallel between aging and sleep yeah. because they're, it's such an upstream, large effector of things. No, cool. that's a very interesting and cool point. Mm. Which is why I want to optimize my sleep so much. Talk about circadian shift. Yeah. Uh, talk about good sleep habits. Yeah. Matthew Walker, for anyone who wants to get into that, is a fantastic professor from America who's a good educator on this subject. Yeah. Great book. Why yeah. We Sleep. Very yeah. cool. Um, yeah, he's also done the rounds on many podcasts. Yes, yeah. Ron, uh, Rhonda Patrick, he's been on Joe Rogan. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Pierre Adia, I think he was on. Mm, yep, yep. Yeah. Mm. All right. We're going to wrap it up, guys. I think we should. <laughs> We're I think people have been... We're getting more and more interrupted as people wake up, so... And, uh, if people have been patient enough to listen through this whole episode... Yeah. Well done. Yeah, well done. Yeah. We appreciate your loyalty. Yeah. Um, novel, novel episode. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, we'll probably okay. circle back on stuff. I think next time we meet, we shall be well rested. Mm. It was good to do this in person, though. Right? Oh, like, mate. The future. <laughs> the future. As, as uh, COVID <laughs> restrictions is, is the future. Bye, everybody. <laughs>